Hello and welcome back. This is Aspen Talks Health and I am Dr. Nicola Ciso. Today I am joined with Dr. Sharon Strauss. She is a clinical psychologist and she has her dissertation on eating, eating disorders. Phenomenal lady. I am so excited to be here with you. We are going to talk today about why we crave food, why I overeat, and how parents can start getting their kids craving healthier food choices. Welcome, Dr. Sharon. Hi, nice to be here. So grateful that you're here. So let's start with me, if okay, that's okay. That's good. Uh, I crave food all the time. Whether I'm hungry or not, my head, my brain is thinking about food. And I really want to understand why, because it's annoying, quite frankly. Yeah. It's taking over. It's, it's, I would call it an addiction because it's, it's really overpowering. So, well, Cravings for food are often addictions. And what they are when we're hungry is one thing. And what they are when we're not hungry is another whole story. Right. So let's talk about what's when, when I'm not, we're not hungry. When our body doesn't re really need nutrition or Correct. nourishment. Then we're hungry for something else. Mm. And food becomes a substitute. It could become our best friend. It could become excitement. It could become a way to dissociate from the pain of the thoughts that we're thinking and feeling in the time. Um, it has a lot of purposes that serve other than hunger, physical hunger. Right. It resolves some other kinds of hunger. It's a better way to think of it. <sighs> Cravings okay. for other experiences. We sublimate them into food because food's accessible. Right. And it's affordable and it's available and it's there. And it's satisfying. It's very satisfying. <laughs> it's a, one of the primal, primitive, early pleasure principles of a baby is to eat, is to feed. Right. And so we were all babies. Right. And feeding was primal then, and it remains primal all through our life. Yeah, I feel like my reward center of my brain is in control of my prefrontal cortex sometimes, which is ridiculous because my prefrontal cortex is the control center. <laughs> so I'm being hijacked. <laughs> That's how it feels sometimes. That's yes. how addictions feel. Right. Your brain tells you it's not good for you. Your brain tells you not to do it. Your yeah. conscious thought is this is not healthy. And yet the craving in, is there, and the temptation is there, and we very often give in to it. So how do you overcome it? Because it keeps replaying until I eat the cookie. There's, it doesn't stop. <laughs> there are really three key words that I would use. Please. Just, I'd like to make things simple. <laughs> Good. Because you can't do them if, you, if they're not simple. The first is to delay. You don't satisfy that craving, that urge, that temptation immediately. You put a time delay. Okay. I'll have that cookie in a half hour if I still want it. I can have it in a half hour if I still want it. So first you delay. Got it. Then you distract. Uh -huh. You get busy doing something else enjoyable. Not tedious, not um, aversive, but something enjoyable okay. that you enjoy. So you're otherwise occupied. And at the end of the day, if you have to eat it, we try to limit the portion size, right. and then we do what we call balancing. We balance that error with better behaviors. If it's calories, if it's a calorie issue or a fat issue or a sugar issue, whatever issue we're measuring that the forbidden food is, we balance it out by um, not eating more of it later. Right. And so it only it becomes a, a lot, little treat. a little tiny treat. So we minimize it. Huh. And that's if we can't avoid it altogether. And sometimes using minimization is the treatment of choice. We don't want to be in a constant state of denial. Right. That's what it feels like. That's right. So you let yourself have a tiny little bit. Okay. All right. Yeah, because denial then makes you crave it more. That's right. Why is that? It's just human nature to want what we can't have. Hmm. Is that hard wiring? Or and that's one of the things when we're going to get into talking about what parents can do with kids. Yeah. We never make it forbidden because that only makes the child crave it more and want it more. And it becomes a way of acting out. And if they're angry at mom, they can punish her by eating the forbidden food. Uh, nobody can stop me. It becomes an issue of control. And it has all kinds of other overtones. So we have to be really careful what we do with kids around food, especially when we're trying to change certain behaviors. Hmm. You touched on something important, control. 
because the battle in my head, the dialogue is, I can't eat the cookie because I'm diabetic, I shouldn't. And then I feel, I, I almost want a sense, I've lost my sense of control. So then to get control, I eat the cookie because then I'm in control, not the diabetes. Right. And then I feel out of control. <laughs> of course, and it's a cyclical thing and it keeps replaying. So what I'd like you to do, what I would recommend that Please. you do, is to, when you're denying yourself the cookie, uh -huh. give yourself something else. It's okay. like when, if you ever train a puppy, he's eating the sack, you take the sack away, but you give him the bone. Otherwise, he becomes a hoarder. Uh. And he will just hoard all the stuff he's not supposed to have. And children are the same way. So when we take something away, and the self has to be treated like an inner child. Right. When we take something away, we give it something else and return something healthier, something better. Love that. So I'm not going to have the cookie, but I'm going to have an apple. I'm not going to have the cookie, but I'm going to have a whatever is allowed. Right, an alternative. An alternative. So that you're not in denial and um, restriction all the time. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Thank you. Okay, give us a crash course on psychology of eating, kind of 101. Like, why do we turn to food? You kind of tapped on it, but what are some of the triggers? Well, there's a lot of triggers. Um, food is used... Because it's so readily available and eating is such a, an important part of everyone's life and because it's prescribed three times a day. Right. So it's not like um, drinking alcohol. That's an on-off switch mm. if you're a recovering alcoholic. You can stop drinking alcohol completely. Right. You never have to have another alcoholic drink and you'll be just fine. But you can't stop eating. Right. And so it becomes a much more difficult experience to get right and to control and to manage because you can't cut it out you can't have an on off switch yeah so it needs to be managed so um one, some of the ways that it gets misused the reasons it gets misused is if i have a very controlling spouse for example and he's always on me to lose 20 pounds i'm going to keep the 20 pounds on to punish him because i'm really angry with him Hmm. And I don't want to satisfy him or give him that. Even though it's in my own best interest, right. I may use it as a tool to punish him. Or control. Yeah. As you indicated a minute ago, it's who's going to be in control, my diabetes or me? Um, and so we set up these games that we play with ourselves where, uh, around the issues of control. Right. Uh, this happens between children and parents. Uh, when the parents are overly controlling the children's food, the children will set up all kinds of ways to rest control away, and it's usually in it, oh, eating something negative. It's, it's not usually eating vegetables. Or not eating. Or not eating. <laughs> well, huh. that's another whole bargain. Yeah, yeah, okay. We'll get into that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so control, punishment. Um, if we're stressed, it is a soother. Right. People use it as a soother. Instead of um, perhaps getting a massage, they'll eat a bag of cookies. Or instead of reading a good book, and intellectually stimulating themselves or spending time with a friend, which would be enjoyable, they will turn to food. Mm. And food becomes the major reinforcer in their life, and they don't develop other methods and avenues of self-reinforcement, yeah. of finding pleasure yeah. in life. So, huh. and, and how are emotions linked? <sighs> obvious, well, again, those obvious. are all yeah. emotions. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. Just, yeah, you turn to emotions for, for happiness. You turn to food for happiness, right? Some people do. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, why do you think the obesity rates are skyrocketing in children? I think addictions in general are skyrocketing in our culture. Hmm. Um, I think everyone seems to be living with a lot of stress. And, of course, turning to food is one way to relieve that stress. And it becomes a habit. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but sometimes you'll walk into your kitchen and you'll automatically go reach for something to eat. Right. It's not meal time, it's not food time, but you're in the kitchen, and the kitchen is associated with food, and so you'll be triggered to eat. It's like a Pavlov response. Yeah. So we have to, or we have to become aware of this. Yes. What triggers us? Sometimes when we get angry, certain people eat when they're angry. Right. Certain people eat when they're sad. Yeah. Certain people eat when they're anxious. Other people, when they're anxious, can't eat at all. Yeah. Everyone's different. Interesting. Good. I like the idea of, of switching, replacing it with something that you find pleasurable. 
either an activity or if it's a forbidden food, replace it with an allowable food. Allowable. Excellent. What are some common sentences that parents use? This is a tough one. Oh, to I've heard hear. these in therapy. Okay. I'll, Good. When you asked me that question, I was thinking back. What have I heard? <laughs> um, are you really going to eat that? Hmm. You're not having seconds, are you? Do you know how that dress is going to look if you gain any more weight? Oh, wow. What are the effects? Devastating. Absolutely devastating because the child feels personally attacked, insulted, humiliated, hated, despised, inadequate. All of these feelings are generated when a parent talks to a child like that. The parent is not separating out the child and how great the kid is versus the bad behavior. behavior yeah. And that's a real important distinction we need to make always when we're disciplining kids around anything. Is we, you're a great kid and you're better served doing this or this is a better look or good kids do this. Mm -hmm. This behavior doesn't fit with being a good kid. So we isolate the behavior, we condemn the behavior, uh, we try to extinguish the behavior, but while preserving the child's sense of self. So if you have a child that's overeating, what is a sentence to get them, th that's a kind, loving sentence to get them to not eat that second bowl of pasta? I would whatever. use distraction okay. first. My first line of defense, when Johnny finishes his first bowl of mac and cheese, and before he gets to ask for a second, or even after he's asked for a second, I would say, you know, we can have that later. It's sitting there. We have leftovers. We can get that later. Again, that postponement, delay, distract. delay, and we distract him and get him involved in another activity. Interesting. And pretty soon it'll be a different meal time. And if he wants that same food again for that meal time, uh, maybe yes, maybe no. And by then he might be full. You got to give us some. That's like right. Time, right. That's right. Interesting. So that's one technique. What other um, common sentences that lead to If that? I had a see a child who's really overeating, I want to know what's bothering that child. I'm right. looking for how are they compensating for, with food for whatever else is not happening in their life, whatever's going wrong. How often does it come down to not feeling good enough? Always. Right? Always. Huh. So you want to look to see what's happening to cause them not to feel good. Is there a way to ask that as a parent without kind of you know, as a parent, you've got to be delicate, I guess, with children. Well, I think if, as a rule, when you, early on, so there, believe it or not, there are some parents that don't talk to their kids when they're infants, because I had one parent tell me, well, the kid doesn't understand. Why would I talk to him? He can't answer back. Why? Language is something that we give even before the child can understand or talk. We're always talking to them. So we're in the mode of talking. Some people talk to their in vitro children, um, very often we're encouraged to read to them, sing to them, talk to them. Some people feel that it's communicated in vitro. But you set the stage by always having a communicative talking relationship with your child. And you start by talking about nonsense things when they're babies, because right. there is no discipline. And around the age of two, the discipline starts entering into it when you have to start saying no or a year and a half if you have a precocious child. Um, and that's where we make the distinction between the child and the behavior, and this is where the child's ego starts getting damaged. So you're a good boy or girl. This behavior is You're a great boy or girl. On. This behavior is terrible. This behavior. Um, yeah, we don't, ha we don't do this in our family. We don't do this in our home. We mm. just, good boys don't do this, good girls don't do this. And they want to be good. They yeah. will work and strive to be good and to please you. This is instinctually what they're all about. And so we need to program them to do that. Right. We all want our parents' approval. That's right. So you have an overweight son or daughter. The first step is to sit down and, 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 try, and try to understand why, what is bothering them, if something's bothering them. It could be that in the culture of your family, you've taught that child they need to finish everything you put on their plate. Now, if you've taught them that. that and he's doing it or she's doing it, you can't blame the child. You have to change your message. Right. Um, if you're giving the child too big of a portion, 
portion size in our culture is so off. Yeah. For example, they give men and women the same dinner in a restaurant. We don't need the same amount of food that the men need. They're usually 30, 40, 50, 60 pounds more than us. Hopefully 20 at least. Yeah. And we shouldn't be consuming what they're right. consuming, calorie-wise and volume. But in our culture, the volumes and the portion sizes are all skewed. And we've also been taught not, you touched on something, you, we've also been taught not to listen to our bodies. I heard once that up until five years old, you can't get a kid to eat more than their, if they're full, they're not going to eat anymore. But then at five, somehow they, they're trained to stop listening to their body and keep eating. I agree with that 100%. Fascinating, huh? Yes. And then you have to try and reverse all this. That's <laughs> later. right. Instead of respecting that child right. from the beginning, <laughs> huh. which is hard for us parents to do sometimes. Yeah. We think we know what's best, but well. that child's internal workings probably know what's best. So you find out that your child is, doesn't feel good enough from They're being bullied cause. at school. Their sib is really being, their the sib ship isn't working out the way it should. Um, you are saying things, you're stressed, you're depressed, you're anxious about your life, and it's filtering down. Parents are fighting, the marriage, all kinds of things could be stressing the child, and we just have to find out what they are. It could be uh, a learning issue. Okay, interesting. Even just being present, because parents are so stressed now, they're not really present when they're with their kid, and that can cause some oh, yeah. stress. Oh, yeah, and that's what I meant by setting the stage to be present. Right. On a regular basis, where your focus is on them, yeah. not on yourself. So then how can, so you find out about this emotional trigger that's causing the not good enough. How do you address it? If it's something out of your control, like bullying in school, and, and you know, you've talked to the principal, or what, you've done what you can, how do you then help the child shift from this not good enough state to feeling better? Well, therapy is a <laughs> good first step. Right. There's, and there's therapists that I'm, I don't treat little children, I only treat adolescents and adults, but uh, even young children are in therapy yeah. because of these issues, and they do play therapy, and through the play therapy, uh, the therapist will say some very healing things, and the child will get a better, more accurate experience of themselves, yeah. and the warp that yeah. they were experiencing from before starts to heal yeah. and resolve and dissipate. So it's the corrective emotional experience. And then we work with the parents yeah. to stop doing whatever the toxicity is. Right. So we changed their environment, so it's not continuing to happen. Good. In some situations, I've recommended that parents transfer the child to a different school because it's a bad situation. Wow and for a variety of different reasons, yeah, yeah. and the kid needs to be taken out of there. Can't control yeah. all of them, but right. he needs to be protected. So every case is different. Different, right, of course. But shifting from, are there any techniques to, to feel, make, make someone, <laughs> help someone feel good enough? Is there well, anything? first you need to find out what they feel bad about. Got it, okay. So if everyone else can roller skate and they can't roller skate, you teach them how to roller skate. Okay. If everyone else is very thin and they're the only chubby one and they feel bad about that, right. then you work with them in an intelligent way to say, this is a fixable problem. Right. All this, is, this is not you being bad. This is the fact that you've been taking in too many calories. It happens to all of us from time to time. We can fix this. Do you want to work on fixing this? Yeah. And then you sit down and you do meal planning with that child and you do meal preparation with that child and that child's involved in learning to eat properly, wow. portion size and a choice of food, and depending on their age, even calorie counting. Right. Or just designing, you don't even have to do that. If you design the meals and that's what the child's eating, naturally it's going to happen organically, the yeah. way it's going to come up. And also we want to increase the activity. Right. That's the other side of the equation. So if you have a couch potato, mm -hmm. he may not be eating that much more, but he's not burning any of it off. Right. So we would work with the child on getting them more physical. Excellent. Yeah, if, smart. if they're really klutzy, I would get a coach or something to work with them on sports. Sports are really important to boys. Other things are more important to girls, but depending on what the problem is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We that address it. Very, very tailor-made.
Good, that's helpful. Sit down and first figure out the real trigger. What's the emotional reaction? Mm -hmm. Excellent. How uh, can parents reward their kids in a healthy way? Okay. Food is what we call a primary reinforcement. Yes. And we always start with primers when we're trying to shift a behavior. But even when I'm working with parents, I go right to the side. I don't use food. Don't use food to reward. Go right to the secondary. You want to reward your child for a, a learned behavior? You have them make a hand on a piece of paper, okay. and you put stars on each day. They either do the good behavior or don't do the bad behavior. Okay. And they earn five stars, and then they get a special prize. And what can be the special prize? I used to have a grab bag of silly little things, and they would put their hand in and pick one. Okay. A box of pencils, a box of crayons, a coloring book, whatever age-appropriate little toy. Okay. A truck, a whatever, for a boy, for a girl, a little doll, whatever. But the sentence, if you're a good boy or girl, you'll get some ice cream? Not if you, you're always a good boy or girl. The behavior. The behavior. Behavior. This behavior is what we're working on. You are a fantastic kid. And that's why we don't want you to do this, because fantastic kids don't do this. This is for the nasty kids. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. You know what I mean. I know. <laughs> I'm kidding. For the kid you don't want, however you want to phrase yeah, 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 yeah. it. So we work on the behavior, yeah. not on the child. Interesting. And it's real easy to... to that's a... And but you, if, unless you make that distinction, your child will automatically feel that it's all about him or yeah. her. Yeah. And there goes the self-esteem. Right. There goes the I'm not good enough. Yeah. And I've had, yeah. in family therapy, I've had five-year-olds sit there and tell me that they do sit-ups in their bed because they're too fat. Oof. Oh. So this starts really early, this concept of body image and food. Right. And it comes from what the parents are saying. Also, what... Typically, the mother, the father's usually not the one with the eating disorder. It's usually the mm. mom. The mom's relationship with the food. The mom's relationship with food is really important, especially if she has daughters, mm. and especially as they approach adolescence. They may not notice when they're really young, but as they get older, they look at what mom's not eating, and they want to know why they should eat it. <laughs> See, my mother was the opposite. She would eat until she was so full and then for two hours afterwards, complain that she overate and she, oh, why did I do that? And I ate too much. And it was, it was an interesting, as I almost, I realized later, I think she was actually telling her body that what she ate was poison. You know, you know it, mm -hmm. it's almost, even if it was healthy food, it well, actually gets translated. Well, did she have an eating disorder? Was she, she obese or was she no, anorectic? No, no, always very thin, but we always chose very healthy food, so you can okay. overindulge. So it wasn't a just, weight issue. It no, was... she just overate. She always overindulged. Okay. And I wonder if that's where... So she wasn't taught to listen to when you're no. full. No, definitely not. The other, the other thing that comes to mind as I'm talking about this is certain people have been taught in the culture of the family, for example, if you're from a big family, if you're yes. just seven kids, yeah. you eat as much as you can because you never Quick. know when you're going to get it again. Or there's no such thing as too much. But you eat as often as you can whenever people present food because it's so scarce you or because you it. never get your fair share. And so food becomes this thing that you overindulge in because in, in your youth there was never enough. You nailed it. She's the last of nine. It was eat quick or you don't eat. Wow. She trained, she was trained to overeat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that doesn't work when you change your circumstances and food's available 24 seven right. and you can get it any time. And she's still overeating. Oh, wow. Because that, that fear of not getting food again or not having it accessible is hardwired in. Wow. Our early learning gets hardwired in, in an amazing way. Yeah. And what, I wonder how that translated. And to when me. I work with patients, I work on thoughts, yeah. feelings, and behaviors. This would be a thought disorder. This right. would be an irrational belief that there's not going to be enough food. Scarcity. For me. Yeah. 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 And in her situation, in her real life, I assume she had plenty of food. That growing up, it might have been scarce because right. of all the children. Wow. And then, so why? How am I? Sorry to be about me here, but I'm no, sure it's I'm good. You're a great example. Uh, how does that then translate to my continuous need for food? Is that also a scarcity? Well, I think if the focus, if 
Could that be If any? one of mom's major concerns in life is food, mm. she's going to teach you to be majorly concerned about food. It's just what you're going to learn. Interesting. It becomes part of your vocabulary. Right. Huh. I feel like my trigger is boredom. Or, or, um, boredom is very often a factor. Yeah. Very often a factor. People turn to food to fill in the yeah. boredom. And definitely the good enough. As soon as I feel uh, triggered by any... Inadequacy. Yeah, or, or I have to do something tedious or something like that, then right away you I'm like, You reward yourself. <laughs> it's also used as a reward, right? even though it's huge punishment when it's m more than what we should, or if it's the wrong food. Right. It's not a reward, even though we use it as one. Yeah. All right, so um, can you give us some final word down to the last couple of minutes? Can, are there any other tips for parents with, that are dealing with a child that, that's overeating, eating, choosing really unhealthy, they're kicking right. and screaming for unhealthy food? Well, first of all, get it out of the house. Don't have it around, and don't have anyone else in the family eating it. Ah. It's out of there. If, you, if it's ice cream, you go out for an ice cream cone. You don't have ice cream in the freezer. Interesting. You go to the bakery, buy a cookie. You don't keep bags of cookies. Smart. You can have dessert, a piece of pie after a meal. You don't buy a whole pie. You just get that stuff out of the house. You don't keep chips and bags of stuff and all that garbage food. Get the garbage food out of your home. Excellent advice. And then feed the child healthy foods. He, he or she will develop a taste for them. Yeah. It's, do you ever meet someone from another culture and they're used to eating something that in your wildest dreams you would never eat because right. you weren't raised on it, and they right. love it. They've been eating it since childhood. Yeah. Crickets or something. <laughs> exactly. Or chopped liver comes to mind. For <laughs> I, our, my non-Jewish right. friends look at me and say, how could you eat that stuff? It's repulsive. Right. Well, I grew up on it. To me, it's delicious. Yeah. It's the same thing. If your child is raised on good fruits, vegetables, healthy, lean meats and chicken and fish and all that stuff, and that's what they're given to eat all yeah. the time. That's, that's their taste buds develop. Yeah. And then when they eat something really greasy or sweet or fatty, they will actually sometimes experience an indigestion right. issue because their they're systems nice. are not used to digesting. Smart. One trick I've learned is that to cut, it, cut the fruit up. A bowl of apples no one will touch, but if you slice up apples and put a little cinnamon or, or pears or peaches, whatever is in flavor and in season, they will, you can't walk by and not nibble. It's delicious. Right. And then once you get a little bit of apple with cinnamon, you want so more. So the next time you can't have a cookie, right. give yourself an apple. Yeah. Because it is delicious. And actually yeah. it tastes much better. better than the cookie. Absolutely. When you really focus on Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And your child will learn that too. Right. Yeah, for me, I, I, I think the wheat is, all, is also addictive because if I don't have it at all, but also if it's not in the my gluten. house, that you hit gluten it. Gluten is extremely addictive, especially in our culture, and so many people have gluten intolerances. Yep. And they actually feel horrible, and they don't realize until they're in their 40s yeah. that every time they eat bread, their stomach swells and they get a stomach ache yeah. or pasta, and they keep eating it, and they don't realize the connection. So and then one day they, it dawns on them, gee, if I cut this out, I'll feel better. Right. That's true, and it works. All right, well, we are out of time, but thank you so much. Such a treat. Oh, well, thank I hope you. It was helpful. Us, oh, so many nuggets I can personally take home with, and I'm sure many parents out there can as well. So please tune in to AspenTalksHealth.com, and you can find out more information and uh, Dr. Sharon's contact information. She's a wealth of knowledge. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.